Hey everyone. So this video this week, it's a long one, right? I mean, you're seeing that if you clicked on it, thank you. Although a lot of you watch the really long stuff on this channel, I have no idea why you have this much time and listen to my dumb ass with the spare time you have. This is a talk I've wanted to give for a while. Uh, I've had various versions of it. You know, I mean, over the years, like, hell, like DEF CON 19, how frickin' that was a decade ago, I talked about gun safes and gun storage boxes, but over the years, I get a lot of questions about, hey, Dave, like, you're the lock guy and the gun guy. Like, how do I lock up my guns? And I've been putting these notes together. Well, finally, someone said, look, we really want to have a good lecture. What can you do? Can you give us a talk? And I said, yeah, you know what? I've got, I got one up in the chamber here for a while. And I finally cocked and locked that round and fired it off for the Liberal Gun Club, which uh, you've seen me mention them before, right? Uh, Liberal Gun Club. I don't really identify as a lot of things politically, I'm not entirely a liberal, but uh, um, I do like what they are as an organization. I like that uh, their whole emphasis is that guns are for everyone, not just um, MAGA hat wearing, blue lives flag waving, you know, shit stains. So if you haven't checked them out, please do. In fact, if you want to give them a click, I think they're going to release this on their channel as well. So you know, watch it on their channel, subscribe to their channel. They, they, it's, they have a whole distance learning series. They have bench doctor sessions with different guns. They have a lot of cool information and I'm happy to be part of that. So yeah, give this a watch here, give them a subscribe there. I'll, I'll link down in the what's it below and hope you enjoy. Learn how to protect your collections and be safe and I will talk to you soon. Uh, tonight we have a, uh, a very special guest that's uh, been brought to us uh, we, uh, via our uh, DMV chapter, and I'm going to go ahead and let uh, I'm going to go ahead and let uh, David go ahead and make the intro. You guys are all muted on purpose. Your video is turned off on purpose. If you have questions, drop them in the Zoom chat or on the Discord server. And if you're not on the Discord server, we'll make sure you know how to get there after the fact. If we haven't already dropped the link in the chat tonight. And if you're not on either of any of those, and you're here with us on YouTube or Twitch or Twitter, or Facebook, um, the best way to get your questions answered is to register for the event and drop into the Zoom chat. And then the second best way to get your questions answered is to make sure you're on the members on the Discord server and ask questions in the live stream channel. Uh, so with that house cleaning out of the way, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to David to introduce our very special guest. Thank you. Please welcome Steve Olaf. We previously invited him to the LGC DMD meeting and that Content is split between our YouTube channel and his. We discussed firearms policy and gun culture 2.0. This time, he will be discussing the safe, the safe storage of firearms. This builds on his professional experience as a physical security expert. Right on. So we're gonna we're gonna just take it away. We'll do this thing. Cool. Thank you for having me. Uh, I, I always enjoy getting to speak to this audience. Um, the, the feedback is always pretty exemplary, and I like to think that much of what we all discuss at this and all the other distance learning meetings are really actionable. So that's my hope for tonight. I, uh, I'm on the road. I'm not at my usual house, my usual place, but we touch on travel on the road storage, storage in your house, storage elsewhere, storage of firearms in general. So yes, uh, as has been alluded to, uh, my name is Devian Olaf. I do a lot of physical security related things, right? Uh, I run a covert entry team. I get into places where we are not supposed to be. That is the side of me that everyone kind of sees in a lot of conference talks and I get a lot of Twitter feedback and, oh, the job is so cool. How do I train to do that? I'm like, well, there's a lot of things you can learn how to do that. Uh, but that is not my only training. I am a SAV to certified safe technician. I am a vault technician. I am GSA certified, so going onto the base, checking out the skiff, checking out the GSA containers, uh, manipulating them open when they fail. Uh, also, I, I should just say, manipulating a safe isn't always something you have to do. Here's a freebie for you. If you ever come across a safe, especially if you're on government property and someone says, I don't know how to get into that, can you get into that? Always try the default combination, what is known as the out of service combination, 50-25-50. Uh, this is footage of my wife and I at the Museum of Flight. This was a uh, Air Force One. This was President Kennedy's Air Force One that you could walk around and you could tour it. And I reached down. I said, "Oh, look, there's a safe." You know, just my wife grabbed her phone. She's like, "Oh my God, what is he doing?" And yeah, I was set to the out of service combo. 
Apparently, the docent said that was the first time that safe had been open for a very long time. Uh, it's not said to the out-of-service combo anymore. If a safe is really misbehaving, you can do what is known as neutralizing a GSA container. Uh, that is the sanitized language of our trade, talking about, you know, get your carbide out, get your power drills, your box drills, your quills, and blast through that. Uh, this is a, a similar container being neutralized by someone, not me, although many of you are techie, so many of you have heard of this incident. Uh, not too many people have seen the photos, though. Does anyone remember when that uh, DNS root key signing ceremony couldn't take place a, a little while back? Uh, this, that's the actual scene from inside the secure cage of uh, someone they called in to try to get through it. Because that is what I do. I do a lot of PhysSec things. I also do uh, Pew Pew related things. That is why, of course, I am here and, I, and why I'm a member. I have grown up shooting. Uh, like many of us, I grew up really young. I was introduced to firearms at a very young age, even before they were firearms in my hand. I, I had a Crossman air rifle. My dad took me to the range with his Browning Challenger, and then later his Smith & Wesson and his Colt. And to, to this day, it's carried through to my life. My wife and I hunt a little. My wife and I compete. Uh, for anyone who's not heard of ASI, Action Shooting International, it's a real nice toe-in-the-water, easy-going type of competition. Uh, no ma it's practical movement, but no major physical hurdles. If you have bad knees or bad back or something, look for it in your area. I write for a lot of publications. Firearm blog is probably the most common one where you may have seen me. I have a license to carry. I run events for new shooters. I mill and print firearms because I think that's very cool. Uh, this is an example of just, you know, at home, just home fabric cobbling, right? So turning a, a polymer 80 into a Glock. Uh, this was turning an 80% AR into a build. Uh, this was also actually an 80% that I did. I did all of the work on the restoring and re recreating the original cult logo and the roll marks. So I, that is kind of my collection, right? I am a, I'm a gun collector, right? In the sense that many of us are, are collectors, meaning we kind of have been buying firearms for a long time and we sell them less often. So yes, that is, that is what I do. And I want to talk about how we keep our collections around, how we store and safely protect both our guns and other people around our guns. And that starts off, any practical discussion about security really starts off with threat modeling. Uh, this is the first thing we do when we have a new client, right? When we have a, a client who asks us about their physical security posture, before we do all the cool break-in stuff, we have a kickoff meeting and, and a series of them. We say, all right, well, what are your actual practical threats? What kind of assailants and bad actors are you worried about? Are you worried about just sort of opportunistic uh, street-level criminals? Are you worried about criminals that have a little more trade experience or hardened criminals? And, and this is a real thing. People who used to be alarm installers or cable technicians. You know, I, my wife and I were at the grocery store recently and they said, oh, hang on, can, you know, we're, our cards are down. We, I don't know if we can process cards. The internet's down again on this block. And I said, why? And they said, oh, the pharmacy got hit. I said, you're going to have to unpack that. And they said, oh, yeah, every, you know, every year, maybe once or twice a year, people try to steal from that pharmacy. And they apparently, the gang who does it, the criminal <laughs> element in town, they know exactly where the Comcast junction box is. And they knock out the internet so that they can get through without setting the alarms and the cameras off. And I said, oh, son of a bitch. That, that kind of thing happens. Maybe you're really just, you know, keeping your firearms around because you're worried about civil unrest. Maybe you're worried about... Uh, not firearms, but maybe we talk corporate clients, civil unrest. Maybe a corporate client is worried about insider threats like targeted corporate espionage or maybe a, a current or former employee. So we, we build all of these threat models and this discussion with our clients because it really drives the whole rest of the analysis and, and where you're going to prioritize what protections. Well, the same holds true for firearms, right? Many people, uh, especially those with families, will think about kids and child safety. That's a big part of it, right? Uh, protecting your loved ones, not because you just own the firearm, but because you want it out of their hands. And we'll talk a bit about that. We'll talk about there's differences, though, between sort of infant slash toddler children and slightly older children who have more responsibilities. Uh, you know, here you're guarding potentially against deliberate and determined access as opposed to kind of just curious, incidental exploration, right? Older children are different. Grown children, right? Maybe some of us have real bonehead roommates or somebody that you're, you know, your roommate is dating someone who's kind of a, you know, a person who's an oaf and shouldn't be around those guns. Problematic roommates cause real problems for some folk and that's some people's living situations. Maybe you have guests. 
Maybe you are in a situation where you're having a dinner party and you have incidental people coming and going. These are all things you have to think about. It's not just the, the people who live under that roof. It's the people who show up sometimes. Maybe they're invited, maybe they're not. Do you live in a managed you know, sort of dwelling where maintenance can send someone with a little bit of advance notice, but you know, if you're out of town and they say, hey, there's a leak, we're going to be sending someone in there, are your guns policed up and put away in a way that you're comfortable with that? And of course, then you have criminal element, right? You have kind of low-level theft. Many criminals are, again, thankfully, most, most criminals are criminals because they're not good at other things, and they're kind of boneheads. Here is probably one of my favorite videos when I talk about low-level theft. You ever get it? Was this guy crashes through the glass, tries to steal a TV, realizes instantly he doesn't know what he's doing, uh, not to, will not be denied though, keeps, keeps trying, keeps trying, and he has a posse of people. He's got partners who are going to help him out. So they're going to come balling around the corner, bash into the window, fall back down, crawl through the broken window, slip and fall on the broken glass. This guy's like, oh, I gotta be, I gotta be the helpful cat too. Let me lift the lid on this hatchback, which I don't think would even fit that TV at all. More tripping on the glass, more pulling the thing down. Eventually they realize they have destroyed the TV in the process and they just leave it there and then they all run away. Thankfully, this is the caliber of criminal that most people have the chance of encountering if you're going to be the victim of a crime. Is that the only caliber of criminal? No. There are real targeted theft actions where if someone is known to have a valuable asset or assets, people can prepare for it. People can say, all right, we are going to hit this spot. We're going to get what we can and get what we came for. This is a gun store in Texas. This is a gun store where a whole posse of people, they are queued up like a tactical column. They are a stack of guys. When they rip that frontage off, everyone goes in. You've got roles. You've got one guy who's Mr. Smashy Smashy. You've got a crew of collectors running behind him. You've got people who clearly have done their shopping before they came because one guy jumps over the counter. He knows what he came in for. Everybody minds their business. Everybody's got a job. Nobody's tripping all over each other, zipping around the other aisles. They brought bags. I've witnessed so much footage of thefts where people like didn't even show up with a container and they're just running out of a store with crap in their arms. So this is an example. This is a 60-second video. Zam. Cleared out what they could get and gone. That's a real serious threat if you are known to be a person with you know, a large valuable collection. Maybe your collection is so valuable that you are potentially the victim of professional theft, where you're actually getting into the idea of just how good is my safe? We'll talk about safe locks and safe ratings. We talk about all these things, but in addition to, I'm really glad that Liberal Gun Club and others who are working in this space understand that it's not just the other who is the risk. It's not just the criminal, the that party over there. We think about and should risk assess the people under our roof for their own well-being. Uh, if you or a loved one in the house has, struggles with mental health, right? If you struggle with depression, these are all factors that go into the threat matrix and it, it informs how we make the decisions we make surrounding gun storage and gun safety. So what kind of assets are you protecting? This is another real important question because it goes to a lot of both valuation and need for speed of access. Many people, I think, or gun owners have just sort of, you know, a small personal collection, right? They have an assortment of things that they have because they like them and use them. Uh, I love how in addition to collecting guns, this person seems to collect uh, pizza boxes as well. I don't judge. Maybe you are a sportsman, right? Maybe you and your spouse or your loved ones are into hunting. So some of your firearms are hunting arms and maybe they're stored somewhere differently than your defensive arms. Maybe they're maintained differently or maybe they're pulling double duty. Maybe you have a carry piece, right? Maybe your daily driver of a firearm is one that you're constantly taking out, putting away, taking it out, putting away, taking it out, putting away. And the locking solution, the security solution you use for that wouldn't be practical if it took you two or three minutes of interaction each time to open that container. Your home defense, if that's, if that's what you're thinking for your firearms, you start getting into where in the home can it be, right? I mean, a lot of people, although I don't know if crime statistics truly bear this out, a lot of people would think that it's the middle of the night when they're really gonna need their firearm. And if, if you, like me, sleep during the night and you're in bed, is your firearm in the bedroom or is it in another room of the house? These are factors, right? From home defense to community defense, 
right? If you are engaged in people who respond to threats in your region, do you just need a gun or are you have you have full kit, right? I mean, if your gun is being stored one place and your armor is somewhere else and your radio is somewhere else, are you really ready to just grab and go and get out of the house? The full rig is something you have to keep in mind. And is that valuable as well? Is that subject to theft or someone tampering with it if they're a house guest coming over? All of these things are different in everyone's life. Maybe someone's a professional shooter. If you don't know Jenny from, uh, from you know, Finland, uh, Jenny Kosmiaki, like she has high-end firearms. She, has, she is a precision run-and-gun shooter, and her collection is worth a good deal of money, right? There is substantial value there, and we get into not just issues of storage, but also issues of secure transportation. Uh, she is constantly going to matches, both domestically and internationally. And maybe you just have an expensive and extensive collection, something with rare items, something that are irreplaceable, you know, Title II NFA goods. These are going to be far, far different in terms of storage needs than someone who's just got a personal hunting shotgun and a pistol that they wear occasionally going outside. Uh, I should be very clear, I am not nearly this fortunate. This is not my collection, although I do love it so. Uh, this is at Ian's house. I love that wall, by the way. Uh, we always like to joke because we're down in Arizona there, right? Like it's, it's like Burton and Heather Gummer. So yes, I, I definitely like the big gun storage wall. And that, again, that's, that's literally how Ian stores much of his collection because he has dedicated an entire room to his house with additional built-in security. There's, it's just so huge that he couldn't store it all otherwise. And if you're traveling outside of the home with firearms, are they always on your hip? Or maybe you have a trunk gun right? Protecting against a smash and grab. Uh, maybe you have to worry about the law. Like, is it stored adequately for your home state? What if you travel to other states? And if you do that, is your storage solution legal in those states? Is it a pistol? Is it a rifle? Uh, the difference between a pistol and a rifle, not just size of storage, but again, legality between states. If you travel for work, if you travel for pleasure or leisure, right? If you're staying overnight somewhere, maybe it's a hotel, maybe it's someone's house. You know, you you have a few more glasses of wine at dinner and you say, oh, you know, we shouldn't drive home. You've got that guest room. Are you going to do, are you going to lock the gun in the car? Are you going to keep it in the, in the guest room? What if there's kids in the house? We'll talk all about that. And of course, the fact that I am well known as a frequent flyer and world, world traveler, right? Considerations both of TSA and airline policy. That's a whole separate talk I've given. Security at your destination. Go, again, going through various states. Um, we'll talk about my travel setup. And this is, you know, this is the firearm that's with me on this trip, as with most trips, right? I have a little pistol bag, and we'll talk about how I secure things in that bag and what resources I have on me, so I'm always a good guest as well as uh, prepared for whatever comes along. So I should say, gun storage is big business, right? Uh, this, is, this is SHOT Show, right? You're going to see a lot of scenes at SHOT Show. You're going to see a lot of scenes at local hardware stores. Um, products to store and contain firearms, ostensibly for safety, are a huge market chunk and many of them are weak, right? Let's talk about this. Let's be honest with the fact that many gun locks, how many people out there have like gotten the free lock? You know, you get it from your FFL or your, your, your store, your gun store, because your state says you have to get a free gun lock. And it has the little packet that comes with it. And would you think that most of these locks are good? Uh, no, most of these locks are compliance mechanisms. Uh, they are immediately going to falter in the face of even an undetermined, you know, sort of lock manipulation attack. Whether you're shimming or bypassing or using a bump key, or in this case, using some little raking manipulation. Uh, these are not designed with security in mind, right? These are designed to prevent a toddler or a, a youth from having an ND, right? Uh, and it'll say so. The, 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 ma the actual materials you get from a lot of these places, right? If you're buying the lock, they'll say right on them, warning, this is not a security device. It is not going to, you know, stop a determined attacker. It is really just to stop children. And that's okay if we are honest with ourselves and we realize that's the purpose. But a lot of products kind of live in this gray space of marketing where they market themselves as, oh, this is a high, you know, push button, secure, lock box, keep your guns safe from your home and your kids. All right, well, you know, this has got a bypass lock and this bypass mechanical lock is pretty crappy. This one is a wafer lock. Uh, it's, it's the same kind of lock you would have on a filing cabinet. It's the same kind of lock that, 
you know, prevents arguments in the office about who's too cold and can you turn the air conditioning up or down. Wafer locks for anyone who's ever done any kind of lock picking. Again, not hard to manipulate. This is the use of just kind of little jiggler tools and zip, zip, zap, 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 or raking attack here, raking manipulation, or as I said, a, a jiggler tool. Uh, if you haven't learned how to do this, I mean, there are plenty of talks online. My talks are online talking about casual entry through a lot of, you know, really rinky dink type lock products that are, that are wafer locks around an office environment. Wafer lock might be fine for that little shield over the thermostat. Not so much what I would like to see on top of a firearm storage device, right? These are, these are all products you're seeing with wafer locks on them. This is, this is marketed to police for police cars and, you know, police station gun lockers. What's the override key? A very uninteresting wafer lock with very uninteresting key bitting. Um, this one, I, I actually put this in the slides. I thought it was a wafer lock. No, this is another police lock that works with a handcuff key. I understand the mentality. I understand the market segment you're trying to serve. Not really robust in the face of anyone who really can stick a paper clip in there. Uh, this is another, you know, marketed for police cars and other storage. This is another shotgun locker, right? This, I am just using a shimming attack. I'm just using a piece of plastic from, a, you know, a bookmark to, and you shove it in, wiggle it around. If you understand, click, boom, pops right open. So these kind of products that they don't come with that same marketing hype that says, hey, remember, this is just for keeping your kids away. I mean, this is being marketed to be stored in a way that is sold as security. But what does it have? This push button electronic lock? Well, it has a mechanical override. It's not a wafer lock this time. This is a tubular lock. Tubular locks look kind of fancy pantsy, but they've been around for a while. Uh, here's a buddy of ours right down in Virginia, in fact, and he is manually picking a tubular lock. Just because it looks different doesn't mean it's really harder to manipulate. Anyone can learn this. This is, this is one of lockpicking lawyers' videos. It's on YouTube. He's got a billion videos on YouTube picking many locks, including tubulars, right? You don't have to do a manual technique. There are tubular pick tools that are out there. If you've never seen this before, right? Picking a tubular lock with an impressioning style pick. I mean, it's just shove and turn. I have taught people this of many different ages at many different public workshops. There you go, this tubular lock, wiggle, 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 and turned. This is the override for many of your gun safes, your, well, gun safes in quotes, right? Many, I, many people are probably thinking right now that, oh man, my, my gun lock box has an override key. I wonder what it looks like. It, good chance it could be this. This, some of these videos are like filmed in super potato vision because this is almost 10 years old. Some of this material from a talk I gave at DEF CON like 19 or something. Uh, this was a talk about gun safes and gun security. And there you go. There's another tubular override. This is, these tools have been around for ages, right? Uh, this, was a, this was an amazing one, this product, BioBox. You'll even see that it's been, like this company I think went out of business uh, because they were you know, just not good at a lot of things. You can see how quickly that works. But the design is still around. There are other companies to this day. Uh, who is this? Bar Barska? It's, you can see it's the same product, just a new name, and they still got that tubular lock. Barska loves those tubular locks. Is that something that I would want to have my guns behind? I mean, maybe in some situations, not most situations. So keep this kind of stuff in mind in that gray area of, oh, we're a gun safe. Uh, are you really a gun safe? Like, what are you trying to be? Uh, my buddy Dave, uh, Dave runs a channel and a website called Handgun Safe Research. If you want to see many, many, many products of this variety, the sort of sporting goods store, sub $100 or right around that C note mark, gun safe product line just being rocked. Uh, Handgun Safe Research, loads of exploits and he even recommends some good products. I'll talk about some products later that I happen to like as well. This is almost one, I don't know. This was neat, it was a SHOT Show. It's called the Gun Warden. It's, it's for gun stores, right? So you wanna have big racks, public display racks. And it, I get it, you know, what's the override lock? The tubular lock that is pickable. Now we do get into a situation here. Do I think someone is going to take their tubular pick out at a gun store uh, around the public? No, probably not. Do I think that someone in the home who has a lot of unattended time around, let's say this wall safe might take a tubular pick and try to manipulate it open? Yeah, I do. How about this? 
Here we have a multi-wheel combination lock. Combination locks and, and such are hot, right? Because, oh, you need your guns, you don't want to find the key. You got to be able to get in them with a, a bio or a handprint or... Here we have multiple wheels, right? Anybody who is not familiar with the fact that most multi-wheel combination locks are ridiculously decodable with thin tools. How does it work? Uh, well, again, these talks are online. My presentations and others like this are online. This is a video from an old friend of mine named Skyler. He talked about this ages ago. A thin piece of metal slipped down in between the wheels. If you start spinning the wheels, you can often use that thin metal to find and feel what is called a gate. Now, you might not be finding the real combination when you're doing this, but what you are doing is getting the, the notch or that flat spot on the wheels lined up with each other. And once they are all lined up with one another, you can turn the wheels in concert with one another, trying that release or that, that knob every single time. And you just walk the wheels around 10 clicks all together, and there you go. There are a lot of products that love to use those multi-wheels. This, this is a double whammy. We've got a super decodable multi-wheel and we've got a TSA key backup because it's, this is marketed for people who want to fly. Although, remember, the TSA does not need to have the ability to use their keys to get into your guns. You are allowed to use non-TSA locks on your luggage when you fly. That is literally what my luggage was locked up with, non-TSA locks on this trip. For those who do not know, by the way, TSA keys, they are all online. I don't just mean the hackers who released the STL files to 3D print your own. I mean the TSA 007, which is the standard key now. You can buy it like on Amazon. Uh, that also that really amused me at SHOT Show at the Brown Ells booth. All of the guns were you know, locked with cable locks, uh, but the cable locks with this beautiful big M203 replica, right? And a little TSA key right at the end. So, all right, cool. I mean, now honestly, who's really, is it is someone gonna steal, uh, steal us off the SHOT Show floor? Probably not. Uh, there was that one guy. There was a guy in 2019 who stole 65 freaking guns and some silencers and stuff uh, from SHOT Show and was promptly arrested. Because why? Because criminals are buffoons. And he like immediately tried to sell them in Las Vegas that weekend and it just got popped. So he's doing a little federal nickel. But okay, let's, let's get into proper safes, right? And again, safes in quotes. We'll talk about what makes a good safe, but proper gun safes, right? These are, your, these are not lock boxes. This is what some people might think of when they say, I have to be serious, I have to one-up my game, I really have to step, step it up and get a proper safe. Big boxes, big steel, big names sometimes, right? Winchester, Colt. And none of these are made by gun companies, you understand, right? They're all just licensing their name to other brands. And I keep putting safe in quotes, right? Uh, because if you look, if you look at the inside uh, of these doors, you look at these labels, these are not true burglar-rated safes. These are, say it with me, residential security containers. And we will get into some, some standards and ratings. I, I don't want to be too dry here with all of this. Right here, you get, to, you get to look at my smiling face because I hate walls of text. But there are some safes that are actually rated for burglar resistance and such. Some are rated in a, in a, in a crappier way, right? So like a, a B-rate safe that is not burglar rated, it's just a B-rate safe. Has a certain amount of steel, has to be you know built this way, although the standard's unofficial and there's no testing performed. You could have a BC category, which is almost a C-rated safe. Now at least there are standards here, how much steel you use, but again, no tests are performed. Same with a C-rate safe. These are standards of construction, but not standards of true robustness. What we really get into if you're interested in proper safes, I mean talking like if you go to a gun shop, if you go to a pawn shop, a jewelry store, and you look at what they're putting their inventory in at night, their most valuable product, it is going to be what is known as a burglar safe. That's not a B-rate safe, that's a burglar safe. Now we have real standards. I mean, we have Underwriters Lab Standard 687, their high security standard. You have real specs about construction, about strength, about how it has to be open hearth steel and continuous welds, not tack welds. And it, this, is, this is proper standards, right? And with it comes proper testing. The Underwriters Lab will certify a safe as being tool rated or torch rated for this many minutes, so a TL-15 means a testing crew using hand tools and such 
will take at minimum 15 minutes to get into the safe. A TL30 safe, what does that mean? Well, now we're, we're, we're some of you are tracking here. It means the same kind of testing, same similar construction, but it takes them 30 minutes. They have 30 minutes to get in, and they can use a few more tools in the process as well. Uh, TL30 is where we start to see real high security or a 30 by six, which means all six sides of the box are tested. They are all in play, right? Again, this is all underwriters lab standards. This is all underwriters lab testing. They are former safe technicians and safe builders and designers who are hired by the underwriters lab to perform these tests. Now the engineers have the, the blueprints, they can disassemble the safe. They, they can do what someone could do if they were a high end professional criminal. So again, when you think about it, TL, a TL rated safe means that someone is attacking it with basic hand tools, some manual, some power. There are TRTL safes. A T, what is TRTL? Well, it means they can bring out the oxyacetylene, they can bring out the thermic lance, right? They can use torches. There's even TXTL. That means you get to, you get to play with the nitro. You can use eight ounces of nitroglycerin in the process. Uh, but again, there's always going to be a number associated with that, a, a TRTL30 or a TXTL30. So a high security burglar safe is that is your serious business. And most people do not own one of these. These are not common in homes. They are humongous. They are a pain to move around. I mean, you need special training just to install them in most buildings, to, to not break the floor when you're moving them in. That is why residential security containers exist. They serve a market segment that needed to be served and wasn't really being served. What is the deal here? Well, hey, we have actual testing requirements. There you go. And it is the underwriter's lab who does the testing. The thing is they don't use power tools. The residential security container requirement allows for manual hand tools only, um, nothing over 18 inches, no hammers over three pounds, uh, it is not the kind of thing that a lot of criminals would... Nowadays, I mean, portable angle grinders are a thing. Battery-powered angle grinders, if you've ever seen bike theft, the experts talk, they have changed the game. So there is something called a Type 2 residential security container. It's ridiculously rare. I've never seen one for sale. Um, but again, you get to see some power tools are allowed in the testing here. Uh, if you've ever heard, by the way, this product is California DOJ a compliant or California Department of Justice approved. Uh, again, that is not the underwriter's lab. That is, this is just a construction standard. Uh, there are, of course, you know, nice standards. It has to be this strong. It has to have a lock. It has to use steel. Uh, there is one subnote, which is any UL rated residential security container. If it's big enough to hold firearms, it is California DOJ approved. And as you saw, the residential security container standard is not a supremely robust standard. It's, it's better than nothing. It's better than a gun cabinet, right? Uh, there are products. I mean, you walk the stores of, of Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's, like you'll see just folded sheet metal, right? I wouldn't really use this for anything of value, including firearms. Uh, does that mean that every gun cabinet is worthless in, in my eyes? No, not entirely. Again, depending on your threat matrix, depending on what your needs are. This is uh, made by Secure It. This is their Model 52. It's only about $650, right? And it prevents covert access somewhat. Uh, it does have a slightly trustable lock. We'll get into electronic locks in a bit. It might even, you know, prevent some undetermined, unplanned overt access. But for the most part, this is, yeah, no one smashed into this without me knowing it because they would have to smash their way through it. If they want to go smashy smashy, I don't know quite how well this would hold up, but if someone just broke into your house looking for, you know, like medicine or maybe some jewelry, if they saw this, they might not try to attack it. And frankly, a lot of criminals don't steal guns and burglaries. A lot of, a lot of places, it's a very high risk, low reward. Now, there's plenty of prescription meds that are easier to steal, easier to move, that don't have the enhancements on the sentencing. But uh, we've talked about safe locks, by the way. They were part of the standards that I was showing you. We're not gonna spend a ton of time on this. This is not my safe technicians training class that I run, but really quickly, I will, you know, a mental metric here. Uh, anyone who knows the service, right? You've got a first Louis and a second Louis. Which, which lieutenant outranks who, right? First lieutenant outranks second lieutenant, right? It, it works that way with safe dials. Safe lock dials, mechanical safe dials. There are group one and group two. Uh, group, group one is rated higher than group two. 
And there are, of course, our standards and metrics. This is all DOD standard and UL standard. How is this supposed to work? Well, if someone is skilled, they will need more time. Why? Because the, the dial has much tighter tolerance. The internal working parts have much higher tolerance on a group one than a group two safe. Some comparisons here, right? The 2937 is what we use on armories. The SNG 6700 series is what most people have if they have a mechanical safe dial at home. There's some gaps in this chart. Uh, these were the two primary standards forever, but market pressure resulted in the creation of an intermediate standard, the Group 2M. Uh, what does that mean? It just means make a Group 2 lock, build it with Group 2 sort of technology and quality, but make it more manipulation proof. And it's really fun how they kind of did that. I don't know if you can if you can kind of see this. There are little false cuts. There are false gates on some of the wheels. There's also what's called an eccentric roller in the cam. We're not gonna again. I'm not gonna get you bogged way down into safe lock stuff. But I love talking about this. Ask me in the in the Q and A if you want about that. One more on the on the on the chart by the way. If you're curious, there's also Group One R. Well, I don't know. It looks the same as Group One. What's what's the deal here? What is the R? That stands for radiographic, uh, against radiographic attack. During the Cold War, we were worried about uh, the Soviets X-raying our safes to get into our documents. So what did they do? They started making the wheel packs out of plastic, usually Delrin. And if your wheel pack is plastic, well, you can't really see through it with, uh, you know, with an X-ray machine. Uh, plastic wheels, they later dropped that. Nowadays, this is the standard for mechanical manipulation resistant safes. Uh, the 8550, they went back to metal wheels for reasons that you can imagine they're just more robust. By the way, the current, again, I mentioned this, I, I do armory service and repair for the DOD and for, for military bases. Uh, the current armory grade lock for mechanical armor storage and for field safes is SMG's 2937. You put that on your safe, I'm never going to sneeze at you at all. But of course, a lot of people these days don't use a mechanical lock. A lot of people are buying and they like the idea of an electronic lock. It's sort of easier, it's quicker in people's minds. There are standards there. Um, there are ways that you can, there's type one. And so again, Underwriters Lab gets into this, but let's look at this, right? We've, we've got a little keypad. Many people have seen locks like this. Uh, they're not all the same in these photos. There are a few players. This is the uh, NL Rotobolt. NL is a company from Italy. Uh, Securam, like or Secure Ram. You see their name come up a lot. They're touted as a California-based company. All their stuff's made in China. I don't know much about their quality, but I don't trust it very much. Uh, if you have ever seen an electronic lock that has a little contacts on the front, right near an LED, you've got a Lagarde. You've got Lagarde's 33E. That is the, if you have a dead battery, you can push, little, push a nine volt right onto those contacts. It'll power up. Neat feature, but the lock is vulnerable to electronic attack that we can talk about as is the number one player in the market, the SNG 6120. Uh, they had fixed it for a while. I heard a rumor it is vulnerable again. Uh, you can always spot the SNG, not just from the Sergeant and Greenleaf logo, but they've got the little light bulb uh, button on there. They've got the little hood with a light on it. We won't get super into this. Uh, this is our electronics lab, however. If you hook electronic products up to an oscilloscope in super layman's terms, the power usage, it costs more energy, marginally, microscopically energy. It costs more energy to read a one than it does to read a zero out of memory. And you can do what is called differential power analysis. Now, you might say, I don't have an oscilloscope and a lab. Yeah, well, this exists. This is called the little black box. Lockmasters makes it, pull the safe dial off, click it in, opens the safe almost instantly. So when I say I don't like electronics for some things, this is why. Also, there's the fact that, you know, you have problems with, like, magnets. Put a giant honking magnet on the outside of a safe. This is my buddy. He's like, look what I discovered with my safe. I can put a giant magnet here, and all of a sudden, the solenoid doesn't, uh, you know, lock into position. I can just open it. So for all these reasons and more, the fact that auto dialer tools exist, we're not, again, this is not my safe cracking and safe manipulation class. You want to know about the combi and how this product works. You slap it on and just let it chooch. This will blow through all the combinations possible of a mechanical safe. These products exist and people have made their own. Hackers and, and students have made their own auto dialers just to prove a point. So keep that in mind. Here's a big one. Now we're getting back to practical things though. Thank you for, for allowing me that uh, brief diversion there. I, I, I enjoy talking about all this kind of stuff. So fire ratings, fire resistance. This is a big one for people. Fire can be a greater risk than theft in many homes, right? 
And if you open up a lot of safes, if you're shopping for safes and you look at the inside, they even have these stickers, fire rated, 30 minute, 45 minute bandit fire safe. Look at us, 75 minutes, the big daddy can handle it. Look at this one, oh boy, 120 minutes, that's amazing. These all sound very impressive, but notice those fire rating stickers are not from Underwriters Labs, who does fire tests. These are all self-tests, or they're just kind of made up, or they're wildly impractical. This one's great. This, so Ballet, they, they are a Chinese company making very cheap safes, putting them on the American market. I love this graph down here. Uh, you'll almost always see fire rating, whether it's by underwriters or self-test made up, hoo hoo nonsense. You'll almost always see it as referencing 1400 degrees, by the way, because most residential fires don't get above 12 to 13 hundo. Uh, that's why that is the standard. But this graph, this is not the standard. Notice this line, they say, so this is, okay, we subject the safe to 100, uh, 1400 degrees, and here's the internal temperature of the safe. Going up, going up, going up. And it made it all the way here to 90 minutes before, okay, well at 90 minutes, that is 1400 degrees. The internal of your safe is now on fire at that point. That's not helping anyone. That's not how the test is supposed to work. Uh, the underwriter's lab who does these tests, they will classify safes. They will certify safes under certain criteria and they are based around how low the temperature remains inside the safe. So here we saw those, those badges and seals, right? This is a one hour or a two hour rating. And that rating comes with a number. Many times 350 is the number you will see, because why? Well, at 350 minutes, uh, 350 degrees, that is when your paper starts going up in smoke and becoming unreadable. If you use a bunch of outdated electronic media, you might need a safe that is rated for even lower temperature on the inside. Uh, if you use modern storage, like most of us probably have a few super important documents on a flash drive, um, again, that's going to start to cook off pretty badly after 150 degrees. So keep that in mind when you are looking at these, these sort of ratings here. So 60 minutes fire protection, yeah, that's great. But is it really that great? I mean, I can tell you this looks pretty cheap. They're, first of all, they're using particle board. A big why? Why is sheetrock super popular? Well, because it kind of won't burn and it's cheaper than all giddy out. But sheetrock, first of all, it holds moisture. Many times it's made badly and has this like sulfur off-gassing crappiness to it. Uh, a proper underwriter's lab like fire safe is probably never gonna have sheetrock in it. It's going to have like ceramic fiber in it. This is the stuff that would be inside of a pizza oven or a kiln. This is 2300 degree ceramic fiber, right? This is, this is not going to off gas and it's, it's going to really resist the temperature. Many safes, if you have a very high quality safe, will also have a fire, a fire seal. Polysol makes this, right? So what is fire seal? Well, if exposed to fire, it swells up and it actually makes a hard seal around that door jam. Now, it's not just the ingress of fire and heat getting into your safe that matters. It's the water, right? It's not just the whales, it's the water. Uh, if you have a safe in the basement and your house is on fire, even if the fire is not in the basement, your house is getting subject potentially to a lot of water and water ingress into a safe is a thing. Fire seals made to try to mitigate that as well. Uh, I love this ad. This is Liberty Safe. They're like, look, we dropped a cement lock on our safe. Uh, Liberty loves their like gimmicky marketing. I like Liberty as a company, honestly. Uh, but it's funny to me because this is, a, this is a silly test. That would never happen. But dropping a safe is part of the Underwriters Lab fire test standard. So they will cook the safe in a kiln, then they will lift it up three stories and drop it onto a pile of bricks, simulating a safe that has fallen through a structure that, that is burning down. Uh, so again, these are to, to, to pass fire rating, true underwriter's lab fire rating is a big deal. Many products do not. And none of them are infinite, right? The true like fire safe just means you, it buys you time. It's not infinite. That is if your structure, if your house is on fire, okay. If the entire neighborhood is on fire or if you, this poor sap, right? He had his, this millionaire director had his life savings in his safe because he didn't trust banks and he, the California wildfires got him. No safe can survive infinitely. No safe can survive any attack, whether by a criminal or by flame, infinitely. Uh, ammunition, separate topic, worth thinking about if you don't uh, consider this all the time, how you store your ammo, where you store your ammo, 
Uh, this is what our house looks like in the basement. We just have a nice metro shelf. We have all the boxes all pretty like lined up and labeled and so forth because I'm a neat freak and organizer. And inside of there, you know, we live in the Northwest. It's moist. Get yourself some little damp uh, rid or get yourself some, you know, kind of th these little packs of desiccant. They're good for a while. Then we put them in the oven. You cook them off, put them back in the ammo. You just got to set a calendar alert. You rotate that out. Uh, all of our safes have this kind of unit in there. Why? It's, it's easier. It has more desiccant and you just pull it out every so often. You plug it in the wall and it'll heat up and gas off all this moisture and you put it back in the safe. One person I had this conversation with once and I said, man, I could run power into the safe. What if I just plugged it in on a timer every six months? And he said, yeah, you haven't thought that through, have you? It's just going to gas off all the moisture into the safe, you dingus. And I said, oh, yeah, that, yeah, okay, I'm not right. But yeah, that's, keep that in mind. Those rod, those golden rods that you plug in and they're just in the barrel or in the bore. I don't know how they're supposed to be doing anything if you're not actually extracting that moisture from the safe. By the way, storing ammo ready to go, storing ammo in the magazines, that's a question for you and your situation. Your situation is different than someone else's situation. Uh, I can tell you we have some mags let ready to go, but they are inside of other safes and secure items. Just like when I travel. This little dumb product, right? This, this craptacular lockbox that I bought, I think for a contest where I was, you know, can you pick into this thing and open that lock? I was running a challenge. Uh, it's terrible. I actually picked the lock on it while I was in the store to make sure it was bad enough. And they, oh yeah, any students will be able to open this. Bring it out. Bring it to Maker Faire. But I bought it. And even after the contest was over, I use it. Remember that photo I showed you of the way I fly to different destinations with my pistol? I use that for ammo storage. Why? Because inside of that secondary little lockbox, I know that my ammo is always locked no matter the situation. Even if I go through a very non-permissive state and your ammo has to be locked separate from the firearm. Well, this ammo is indeed locked in a separate container, not with the firearm. Talk to your lawyers first, of course. Uh, talk to your lawyer. Don't go through New Jersey with this at all, though, because you got hollow points in there. So, you know, and people ask me, like, wow, you use a cheap, crappy product? Yeah, there is a place and a purpose for certain cheap, crappy products as long as you understand what they can and can't do. And this is where we get into everyone has their own practical considerations that matter to them, right? Like, what is, what is my personal security posture? I'm okay talking about it a little bit. In general, most of what we have on premises, because a lot of our collection is elsewhere. It's at the cabin, it's at other people's houses, it's in locked up in secure storage that we pay for elsewhere. The stuff we keep around, most of it's in the basement. And it's this wall of safes just keeps growing because I keep ordering more of them because I run out of room. That's not where everything is. Uh, the home defense, which for reasons that I will talk about other places, our main home defense guns are shotguns uh, because of the political climate where we live. It's, uh, I'd rather be in court defending the use of a shotgun than an AR. We have a bedside gun, right? And the bedside gun is locked up with a fully mechanical lockbox that's affixed to the bed frame. Uh, we have a downstairs gun. It's next to the washing machine. It's locked up with that same mechanical only lockbox, not anchored into a stud here. Uh, again, I love mechanical-only solutions. I love push-button. If you ever see those five push-buttons, those are called simplex-style locks. I like them a lot for most of my gun products. Now, if anything were to be seriously bad, if we had to leave town, if we had to engage something in a larger sort of civil unrest threat sense, we do have our grab-and-go bags. Uh, I had a whole YouTube video where my wife and I, we, do, we just have at the ready certain rifle bags. They each have are what would stoner do AR, they each have a pistol, they each have all the mags loaded, and they have a bunch of ancillary support things. And yes, they have terrible little cable locks. Because if we take these bags and we go to someone else's house, as we're going out of town, we'll just throw one or two of the rifles with us. If I have to stay in their house, I want to be able to, I don't want to like, hey buddy, can I have some room in your safe? I mean, my friends would be fine with that because they have a lot of safes, but you can use it. Cable locks, right? When I'm flying, I'm flying right now. We're, we're staying with family on this trip. That same case you saw has a crappy little red cable lock in it because I can just lock the gun so it is infant and toddler safe. And then beyond that, I can, you know, lock it up other ways. And all of this, of course, is in addition to other layers of security. 
most of us, I think, understand that electronic security has become really inexpensive and electronic home monitoring has become very accessible, right? There are companies out there whose products are easy to use. So if you have a safe or a gun storage solution and you don't have an alarm or monitoring of some kind, you're not really looking at it holistically. Any attacker with enough dedication and time can get through your safe or your crappy little lockbox. It is giving them not enough time before they get caught that we, that is our goal, right? So having a burglar alarm, having an alert device inside the safe. There's Securam again. I want to evaluate this. I saw it at shot. I didn't pick one up yet. Uh, a buddy of mine sent me this. He made this little product, his, you know, SimTech. What is it? It's a very spaceship looking little thing, but you put it inside of your gun safe and it has a SIM card in it and it has a little cellular radio and it has obviously a motion detector and a sound detector. And if it detects or alerts on motion, it will send you a message. It'll say, hey, dude, somebody's moving shit around in your safe. Uh, by the way, speaking of motion uh, inside of your safe, oh my God, get these. They be, they've super come down in price. The batteries last forever. Uh, opening your safe and all of a sudden you get a nice bright light. You can see everything that's in there. Game changer. Super game changer. I love them. Uh, but again, yes, home monitoring, home alarms, uh, you know, either either IP-based ones that are overt or hidden cameras that are not so overt. Like again, these are all products that can be network connected, connecting to your phone and letting you know if someone is where they shouldn't be. Or you know, you also get a dog, they'll let you know too. So what do I think overall? We're gonna, we're gonna try to give you some conclusions here. Well, okay, I don't like to endorse specifically anything outright because times they are always a changing, but I will tell you, here are some non-awful brands, right? Liberty Safe. Perfectly fine company. AMSEC, I mean, AMSEC's been around forever. They make a lot of different ratings of product. Um, a lot of my safes are guard all. Fort Knox makes some of those smaller boxes that use the Simplex style lock nowadays at a fine price. Am I saying all of these product lines are ideal in everyone's situation? No. I'm saying do your research and apply what you're learning here today. If you're super serious about high value or high security though, this is what matters. Underwriters Lab, the UL listed products, and they will have a list number on that sticker. Like this is the entry in the UL in the Underwriters database where they did the test and in this product passed. Uh, UL listed is not the same as UL classified, is not the same as UL recognized. Uh, UL recognized, that, that only applies to parts and processes and production, uh, not complete finished products. Uh, it's a super scammy thing. There are, there are like fly-by-night infomercial products that make junk pseudoscience. And they, Our product is UL recognized. Uh, no, that, that means you, you have a factory where you're following like ISO standards. Uh, UL classified, by the way, that means the product has been evaluated only for very specific hazards and very specific circumstances. Uh, you'll often see UL classified with fire rating. Uh, that's a very common thing. You got a little C next to the logo, it's uh, valid for Canada, by the way. If you see C and US, it's valid for both. If you don't see any letters, it's a US only standard. In general, uh, you want a rule of thumb, follow the 10% rule. What is the 10% rule? If you have this amount of assets and you put them in a container that is worth about, or you paid about 10% of that, no one's gonna sneeze at you or look at you silly, right? I'm not gonna sneer at you. That is a very common industry rule, 10 or 15% of the value of what you're trying to protect. If that's what your safe or container is worth, you're not doing too bad. Again, home monitoring, it's cheap, it's very functional. It is, it is out there. Nest, a lot of people I know use Nest. You have to buy into the Google ecosystem. Uh, I, I really think Arlo is, if, like, if you just want a basic, simple camera that you can internet connect, Arlo is cheap, it's in the stores. I love uh, Wise. Wise products, for a lot of reasons, again, you can ask me in the Q&A. The other ones, uh, Ubiquity, they're popular. Uh, they paid a ton of money to a lot of internet influencers. And if you saw a ton of ads on YouTube channels and stuff that you like for Ubiquity about a year ago, that's why. Um, are they fine? Like, they're a little complicated, they're very expensive. They're trying to do access control now. They're not good at it yet. I do not recommend them for access control. And simply saves a whole pile of poo. So don't give them your money or use any of their products for reasons that I could tell you about if you really want to get into it. But we can stomp all over Simply Safe. Their, their architecture is ridiculous. Uh, location, location, location. Different considerations in the house. Are you storing your guns in the bedroom? 
Are you storing them in the basement? These are all the questions we've already talked about, right? For risk of access, risk of flood. Maybe, you know, the average American moves, what, every six or seven years, they've said? Schlepping a safe around the house every time you move? Maybe if you have a super heavy duty safe, it's going in the garage. And that's actually possibly better for fire risk because a fire in the structure is a lot harder to put out than a fire in the garage, which has thinner walls and is many times semi-detached. Now, that does mean if you have a garage like this, the, the neighbors walking by with their bikes and their kids and their dogs, oh, look at that giant ass safe in Phil's house. Uh, I love this. This is, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not recommending security through obscurity, but I saw this at my local gun shop when I was picking out the purchase recently. It's a drape. It's a drape you put over your safe. Literally, they show it in someone's garage. Like, yeah, it looks like a wooden cabinet. Would this pass the sniff test right up close? No. But, you know, is it close enough for, for OPSEC for five, five at five? Five feet away, five miles an hour walking by? Maybe. Or again, if you're just displaying things on display, I, this is my friend Penelope, like, yeah, like, the, don't dismiss the gun wall. If you have a situation that you can do it safely and securely and you don't have people coming and going who are visitors, yeah, America. Or in this case, you know, America, right here. Uh, maybe this is what a lot of your houses look like. <coughs> and we joke, right? Maybe you even have a, a cache of weapons underground. But this could be, this is a lot of things that are practical. And again, in our house, the bulk of the collections in the basement some of it's in the bedroom, some of it is elsewhere. There's, everyone's situation is different. And every living situation is different, like on the road. If you're on the road, if you're on in hotels, right, what's the risk? What's the threat? Well, staff, somebody accessing it because they, they have a staff key or someone breaking in. The underdoor tool, right? If we haven't talked about underdoor attacks, uh, this is a thing, man. This is actually at SHOT Show. This is, this is James's room. Uh, we were at James Reeves at his party, and I was showing the Finnish guys, like, the underdoor tool. People getting into your hotel room is a thing. What do I do? Well, I always travel with that heavy Pelican case, right? I've got my non-TSA airline compliant locks, and I use that as my secure storage. That is, That becomes my storage on the road. Uh, someone would have to steal the entire case if they want to get into it. I do not really trust gun, sa uh, gun storage in, like, hotel safes. For anybody who's not familiar, most hotels will have a safe because it absolves the uh, hotelier of certain risks and liabilities. Almost every hotel safe is crappy because it has overrides. Many of those overrides are really easy to access. This is using a little cross pick. Uh, if you, again, like I have a whole talk about electronic safes and hospitality safes. We can get into that later. But I do not put my guns in the hotel safe. If you do that thing where you're storing a gun in the car, right? What's the risk? What's the threat? Smash and grab. That's smash and grab all day. No one's really like having a toddler hopefully sitting in their car unattended for hours. Uh, you know, like that's the, the people yell at you for that in parking lots now, right? Even though five minutes running into the store is perfectly safe. So what do I do if I have a gun in the car? I, I've done this for years. This was my lockbox for ages and ages and ages my, with my old truck. It is one of those little push button deals, right? It's a little crappy electronic lock. Now, what do we see? We see that tubular lock. I didn't like that. I did replace that though. I ripped out the tubular lock. I swapped it for a cam cylinder with that abloy key, that high security lock system that I really like. And I did my best to mitigate it that way. And I, I was super happy with this. This was the one of the things I talked about at DEF CON that old talk like a decade ago. So there you go, just a couple of screws, a couple of half hour with a wrench. And now I have a much more robust uh, key that will be my mechanical override. And I was perfectly fine with that because it was a low value pistol that was in the truck that it wasn't really being parked overnight in bad areas. Again, your situation is different than that person's, than this person's, or than mine. In general, I'm super skeptical of electronic locks, all these little lockbox products, the biometrics. Uh, again, we're not gonna get hard into this. Uh, you wanna learn all about the fun stuff I played around with, making molds and casts of fingers. That was, that was a previous DEF CON talk, right? How to defeat biometric systems with crappy little rubber, you know, fake fingers. Uh, and it worked, totally worked, by the way. Here's, here's a little rubber fake finger. Let's peel it out of this. This is very James Bond. Like you could have this in your suit jacket and then you, you get into the criminal's office and you want to steal his international arms documents. So you stick this rubber finger over top of your own finger. Uh, my left hand is enrolled. My right hand is not enrolled in this safe. But using a fake left finger on my right finger, what do we get? Good toink. We get a gun safe that popped open. Uh, and again, like bio, biohackers, for my people out there, the RFID side of things, I know people who have modified 
their safes to use RFID. Uh, this is my buddy Jake, Eerie Quiet. Uh, he's shown up on my channel before. Like he modified his electronic, his safe with an electronic lock so that when he badged in, he could, you know, just use an RFID system. He printed a little antenna that went where his dial used to be. Kind of neat if you trust RFID. Uh, he trusts his inherently because his RFID is not a fob. Uh, his RFID, like me and my wife, is inside of his hand. So he does an implantable. So as we're getting back around to the big one, right? Guns in the home. Uh, in, that is where most of us care about our guns, where most of us have a lot of our guns. What's the question I've been asking? What's the threat? What's the risk? Well, one of the threats is fire. We've covered most of that, right? What, what is the mitigation for the risk of fire? Well, getting a proper fire rated safe, looking for that underwriter's lab rating if you have real high value items. Uh, and they're not completely unachievable. Again, the 15% rule, the 10% rule here, like AMSEC making this product a nice burglar and fire rated safe, that's an achievable price. And if you have $10,000, $15,000 worth of a few really nice guns, something worth investing in. Flood is more of a risk for some Americans than fire. Hard to deal with that other than changing where you live or the location in the house where your most valuable guns and assets are. Maybe you have some of the collection in the basement, but the super valuable stuff is up in a, you know, an attic. I don't know. You've got to judge for yourself. If you need urgent access to your guns, that's a different risk that you have to consider, right? That's why I really like those push button systems, but I like the mechanical ones. I like those five button simplex style systems. They are generally very robust against manipulation and tinkering, but they are able to be, you know, bam, you can get that open very rapidly if you practice with it a few times. Risk of theft. This is where we start to get into questionable areas. What kind of theft is most likely in your neighborhood? If it's your average casual criminal, any kind of locking solution that's not complete bargain basement might be fine. As long as you have maybe an alarm or a camera or something that will trigger a response, right? Any of the, the local bozo burglar is probably not going to get through something with 15, 20 minutes of time if they don't have any training, if they don't have dedication and tools. That might be fine. The real tricky bit for a lot of us these days is that determined, curious teenager. Someone who has gone to YouTube University, as I like to say, right? In that instance, you have someone who has long periods of possibly unsupervised access, physical contact with the gun storage solution if they want it. Would a simple like locker work? I don't know. Would those little lock boxes work? Not in all instances. If someone can spend time tinkering with a tubular pick or some lock picks, even like monitoring, like during the pandemic, we saw kids learning how to glitch out their home internet so they didn't have to go to class, right? I'd be, you know, not shocked if a kid wants to tinker around the house and then oh, I know they get these Nest cameras, but I'm going to just power off the router for a minute because I know it takes five minutes for the Nest camera to fire back up. Uh, and if you have a real sharp cookie, man, a lot of your kids are smart, right? Maybe even a proper safe. If they have months at a time where they come home from school before you get home from work and they can just play with that safe, I don't know, man. The, so the real solution is, is not in the safe, right? The real solution is talk to your kids. The real solution is teach them. Make guns not the forbidden fruit. And if you think you've got a nice winner of a child that you're raising, at some point you trust them, right? That's what that's how a lot of us were raised with firearms. That's how I was raised. And that served me way better than any other locking solution because I know I was a bit of a curious kitten and I would be able to get into most of the solutions that my parents had for the firearms when I was growing up. And I didn't uh, because, you know, I, somehow they managed to raise me right. So trust your kids. I mean, trust them to a point, right? Uh, if you really, really want, have one of those monitoring solutions inside the safe. This is a game camera, right? This is a trail camera that'll take pictures and then text you immediately. Yeah, you know, you put one of these inside the safe. If your kid is a nice kid, but suddenly he gets that curiosity bug, he gets that safe open, it's a smile. Your picture's now on mom and dad's phone. Because again, our, our kids are still developing their brains. They're not adults yet. As witnessed by this final clip in a sporting goods store, yeah, this is a kid who locked himself in a safe because he was being goofy with his friends. And now they, they start panicking because they're trying the combinations and they can't get the safe open. And then they put, they, if you, you know, if you try combinations over and over, the, the safe goes into penalty mode. 
And now they're really freaking out. And then this person doesn't know what to do. And now they now you got a kid stuck in a safe. So keep in mind, you might trust and love your kids, but this could be your kids too. Uh, they, had, yeah, they had to call the store, they had to call the EMTs, but because it's these days, the kid was live Snapchatting from inside the safe as it was happening. So keep all that in mind. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to answer more questions about this sort of thing. I love, obviously, I, I ran a little long. I don't know if, how long we wanted to talk about this. I'm sticking around for, for questions, but um, I, I just love this kind of material. And I love uh, any audience who's going to put it to good use. So I really hope that you got something out of this. Uh, if you have questions, shout them out. Or if you know, you're a shy person, you can always... I'm on that internet, right? I'm deviant Olaf pretty much on all the things. But yeah, this was, this was pretty groovy. I don't know what uh, people have to say about this or what you're thinking, but talk to me. What, what do we got? Was that good? Was that bad? Did I waste your time? Did everyone leave the Zoom while I wasn't looking? Definitely not a waste of time. And we have a bunch of questions. Some funny, some serious. Cool. Uh, and thank you for the presentation again. Dig it, man. Yeah. You want to start with funny or serious? Oh, I think you always start funny. And you then uh, funny. then you go serious, then you flip back and forth. Uh, okay, well, this one's from one of the guys that was beforehand. And he says, I have a huge stack of floppies with ancient low-res internet memes on them. How do I uh, secure these? Well, definitely you want to consider securing them by, A, buying a USB floppy drive and, and backing them up to, you know, to the cloud. Or if you have them in a safe, uh, what was uh, floppy disks are uh, only rated to to 125. They are they are a low rating temperature. So get that underwriter's underwriter certification for a good you know 125 degree safe. Nice. Speaking of internet and a more serious note, uh, doesn't network connectivity and the Internet of Things style item doesn't that bring its own set of challenges that can outweigh the benefits, especially it, with the it can. concerns that we've seen on uh, tech dirt and whatnot? Yeah, and that's why I, when I mentioned ubiquity, I, I don't want to just poop all over them, right? But is the, again, they make a good camera solution, but now they're trying to do access control and locking products, uh, and they're not ready for it. They're not ready for that segment of the market. What we've looked at, we're not impressed at all. Um, people want to get on the, you know, oh, I got my cell phone, I can control it from uh, the clicky clickies. Uh, I get it. That's that is the trend, but if people just rush into it, I don't know, man. There's a lot of people doing access control wrong. However, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, back to a funny question: When you're out and you're using the, let's say, lesser quality locks, like when you're in a hotel, you just have the cable lock or mm -hmm. whatever. Do you even bother bringing a key, or do you just pick yourself? Uh, open whatever it is you brought. I have a, a collection of those little crappy cable locks from all the guns that where I was living back east and I'd get a free one each time, many of which I no longer have the keys for. Because um, again, I could just rake it open. I always have picks. Instead, of, you know, picks work in everything. I don't want to save this one key for this one lock. I mean, I lose that, I don't care. Nice. Uh, earlier you mentioned the out of service combination for the safe on the plane. Yes. I think it was. What was that again? 502550 is the standard out of service combination. Uh, there are some people will set 10, 20, 30. It's, you know, it's the numbers that you expect. If somebody set a cheap combination, sometimes it's just all 50. You just dial the dot, all the wheels right till you hit 50 and then try the handle. But the official DOD standard is 502550. Gotcha. Uh, someone mentioned the DEF CON shoot and what uh, they can bring to it. If there's any other additional information you can share about that event. Yeah, so for those who uh, may have heard me mention this thing called DEF CON during this presentation I just gave, right? I've, I've said, oh, I've spoken at DEF CON. It's this large hacker conference every summer in Las Vegas, uh, except for last summer it was the pandemic. They are doing an in-person sort of hybrid mini DEF CON this year. But prior to the start of DEF CON, uh, in the summer, there is the DEF CON shoot. It is one of the events that I run. It's the annual on the calendar that people kind of look forward to, bringing out their weird stuff. There's a lot of, here's this thing I never shoot ever. Other, other times you want to try it. There's a lot of, hey, you want to try this at DEF CON shoot. Um, it is just about anything you want to bring, as long as it's not a fire risk. In the past, people have gotten in some heat for using Tannerite. We go out to BLM land, right? We go out to just open land in Nevada, and fire risk is real most of the time out there. I know Tannerite's not really an incendiary, so yeah, but no Tannerite, no tracers. Other than that, 
I mean, we've had a lot of NFA gear. We've we've had people lobbing off uh, forty mic mics with the chalk rounds. We've had a lot of belt fed. Uh, yeah, it's it's a good time. Excellent. Now, where do you draw the line between paying for additional insurance and paying for additional security? You mentioned that ten percent rule of thumb. Yeah. Is that there is anything else that you would add to that? Oh, dude, I should have added a slide to this whole presentation. I just realized. Um, so insurance is a huge thing, and that's why the Underwriters Lab standards exist. Many insurance policies will stipulate you have to have a certain caliber of protective posture. Um, I, I definitely have insurance. So my wife and I have USAA for a lot of insurance needs, and including our home insurance. And it's a fun. It's kind of fun too because to to get a proper policy, you actually have to inventory all your stuff, and that was like. That was a whole day of me with a spreadsheet, just like going through boxes and cases and like, oh, fuck, more firearms. All right, let's get these serial numbers written down. Let's put them on the list. And then they quoted me a quote, which is laughably low. Uh, I mean, homeowner's insurance and renter's insurance are pretty cheap because spread across, you know, advertised across a whole population, tragedy befalls a mercifully small percentage of us as citizens. Uh, so yeah, I mean, just get get yourself homeowners or renters insurance. List all the firearms except the ones that you lost in a boating accident, and that's a real that's that everyone should have gun insurance because it covers you for so many things. You showed some is it abloy keys? I did. did um, are those your actual keys? Those in the presentation were not my current keys. Uh, the little lockbox that I had for years in my truck that was the key for it. Uh, then I gave that box away when I sold the truck to a buddy of mine. So that's his key now. But the reason I ask is that one of the follow-up questions for that is how easy are those or how vulnerable are those keys to being decoded from photos compared to, say, a normal one? They are decodable. Uh, and I love that you're bringing this up. The idea of photo decoding is a, is a talk. I gave that a talk at Wild West Hackenfest. I think it's called Copying Keys from Photos, Molds, and More, if you're curious. And yeah, like taking a photograph of someone's keys is an absolutely valid vector for trying to duplicate them remotely. Now, is it harder with uh, something like a Protec lock? The Abloy Protec is that series of Abloy lock. Yes, uh, cutting the keys, could you do it manually? Maybe. Getting the blanks is really hard. It would be a much higher level of effort than, say, copying someone's house key, which we, I mean, we, we have a surveillance class where we push cameras really far out uh, with prime lenses and even telescopes, and we've done copying a key at half a click away from a photograph, and it worked. And it was really fun. The students loved that one. That's impressive. Uh, do you have any advice for security and safety with gun storage with regards to mental illness? So that is an interesting fact where a lot of the a lot of people in my life are f very very. I'm very pleased that people are more willing to talk about this than they used to be in previous generations. Many of the people in my life have gone through uh, counseling. They have gone through, or for a lot of things. I mean, uh, frankly, the, the, the friends I have tend to be more at risk for a lot of uh, mental trauma and abuse. I mean, the LGBT community is, they just have much higher rates of depression, suicide, etc. And many of the people I know who have gotten into firearms because they contacted me as you know, they got worried about trends politically. They got worried about um, right, right, rightist violence. And so I have trans friends who said, hey, I've never owned a gun before, but I want to learn and I want to get one. But I'm worried for myself. Like I've gone through a lot of bouts of trouble. And I said, well, all right, let's learn about how to take the bolt out of it and, you know, have the farm. You can do all your, you can do your posture drills. You can do sort of kind of dry fire drills, but not really. Uh, but I'll have the bolt in my safe. And if you ever have a need, like, oh my God, there's, I really need the firearm, things are bad, like, come to my house and get the bolt. And that giving them a little extra buffer of, if I really need the firearm, I have to go over to someone else's house and interact with Dave, and I'm going to look at them and be like, oh, how are you doing today? I'll have a brief conversation. That's been our system for a while. So there's always a way... If, again, if you think about what your risk matrix is and how you're going to put that firearms into that risk matrix. Excellent. I'm going to plug some of our older LGC videos as well where we've discussed uh, dealing with physical disabilities yeah. and non-physical disabilities as well, mm -hmm. along with uh, substance abuse too. We have some of those out there. Absolutely. 
and being being a, I will just say like during the worst breakup I had uh, before this marriage I was with someone I thought I was going to marry her she had kids it was a lovely situation and when that relationship ended it was the worst time in my life and I took all of my guns and I drove them to my office and put them in the safes at the office just because I said this is the most responsible thing I can do this weekend because I'm about to get really hammered and have a, what we call a hard reset firearms give you more time to think it through that kind of thing i mean yeah i didn't think i wasn't in a place where i was like having ideation of self-harm but i was like i'm about to be in a really negative mental place and adding alcohol to that mix and let's just go ahead and not have firearms under this roof right now that seems like a responsible thing to do makes perfect sense i don't have that many questions left i think this is the last one actually cool. uh, do you ever attend any of the smaller midwest conventions like i'm gonna probably not say this correctly GRCon, grr con yeah, so I I feel like I might have spoke at the very first GERCON ages ago, and I haven't been back for reasons that are my own personal failing. Uh, Circle City Con is in Indianapolis. GERCON, for those who don't know, is in Grand Rapids. Uh, people may have dropped others in the chat. Uh, yeah, I, I, love, I just love getting to as many events as I can, and unfortunately last year took a real toll on us. But yeah, I, I would totally go to Gurkhan. Somebody, uh, somebody invite me to go do a shoot there, or just wants to come say hang out and have a whiskey. You got my attention when you said whiskey, so I think we're good there. Uh, I, I don't have any other questions. Oh, actually, someone just said uh, Trigger Con. Oh yeah, so that's a that's a shoot that's a firearm shooter event. It's not really large either. Um, I've never been. I'd love to go. Excellent. We might be able to find somebody here. Uh, Here's a more lock specific question that just popped up. Other than brute force, is there a known exploit for simplex locks? And I think we're going to have that be the, the last specific lock question that we uh, field here. Sure, sure. Uh, so again, the simplex is that five buttons, usually in a row. There was a simplex door lock that was five in a little circle. You don't see those on containers. Um, no, for the most part, the, sim the two big vulnerabilities, the original Kaba Simplex, the, the Kaba Simplex 1000 series, was a door lock, and it had a mechanical collapsing arm clutching system that was made of metal, and that could be exploited with the use of a heavy magnet. A heavy enough magnet, about a 90-pound pull, will allow you to bypass the Kaba mechanism. Now, I've never seen that implementation of a Simplex lock used on a gun container or any container of any kind. Uh, Kaba later fixed that, and later generations of product are not vulnerable to the magnet. Likewise, all of the gun storage containers that I've seen are not vulnerable to that. Early generations, even by Fort Knox, who has since changed this because of my buddy Dave getting on them about it, were susceptible to what was called a knock-through attack, where the mounting bracket on the rear side of the buttons was not robust enough, and you could just smash on the buttons with a screwdriver and knock the entire lock mechanism out, out of the wall. Uh, you, it wouldn't open. You still have to know how to fish around and hit the release. But that was a vulnerability that you could do. Uh, since then, and since his videos about it and his writing back and forth with them, they have a big heavy steel bar behind the lock mechanism mitigating that. Gotcha. Um, I think we're going to move on to Ed after this last question here because we're running at about an hour and a half now. Yeah, and it's dinner question. time here soon, so yeah. Oh, yeah. Last question, um, with regards to geographical location, uh, does living on a cul-de-sac with one access and egress, is that any safer when it comes to burglary, or is it worse? Is there, I mean, it's a trade-off, I would assume. I mean, it definitely means that if someone's approaching your house with a vehicle, which most burglars do, I mean, most people aren't crawling through fields. Um, if someone's driving down your street, at the very least, your camera's going to catch them if you have cameras outside. And most cameras these days are unfortunately used for reconstruction as much as they are for immediate detection. So yeah, having good cameras that can do some license plate quality resolution, uh, you'll see that yeah, or there was that car, or seeing that same car on the block over and over again. I don't want to turn everyone's home into a police state. That's why I really, by the way, like the idea of a camera inside the safe. Uh, you're not turning your home into a surveillance operation uh, for your kids. But yeah, the idea of Oh, why is that car? You know, if you want to do license plate recognition, get a little little Genetech LPR camera pointed it down your block. Get a little alert when you get weird cars coming up and down the street. I know some friends that would be crazy enough to do that. I like the idea of living. I mean, we live somewhere that's kind of very removed from a sense that 
if you don't belong on that street, you're probably not showing up on that street. So I, I, I like that kind of living. Excellent. I'll hand it over to Ed because we are running out of time here. Well, I think we could have gone for another uh, hour. Uh, so I do appreciate, uh, I do appreciate, Dean. Thanks for for coming in and spending time talking to us about the you know the physical security of our environment. Uh, it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart, but uh, you are much more eloquent than I am. So thank you. I do appreciate that. And uh, what we're going to do is. Uh, let you get the dinner because that's about to happen apparently yeah yeah at that time in uh, central time i think you said you were uh and uh i think with that i'm going to go ahead and uh wrap things up uh next week we're going to revisit scott's blueing uh exercise uh hopefully his internet will stay on this time uh and uh, stay tuned to the website for further uh further events like this and dave when we figure out our national meeting, we're going to invite you to it, and uh, we would love if you'd show up. I would love to be there. Uh, and maybe give us a give us an in-person version of this, because this was excellent. I would love to do this again. Thank you. And I wrote this talk just for this. Uh, you inspired me to put all this together. It's all kind of been up in the old coconut, and I get get it out on the page. I love publishing and getting it out there, so thank you. Outstanding. You can add an insurance slide. Uh, and on a related note, club members... Uh, we are a USA shooting affiliate club, which means that you can call Locked in Affinity and get your own uh, insurance for your firearms collection directly from them if your homeowner's insurance for some reason is reluctant to add it as a rider. Uh, that's my insurance shtick. Uh, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and stop the stream. And uh, folks, uh, as always, we'll be in the Discord server, uh, quote unquote, pub night. Uh, so I hope to see you there. As Kyle has dropped a link. Mm -hmm. in the chat you do need to be a member so have your member number ready if you don't already uh, if you've not already logged into our discord server uh, sorry to miss the discord night i'll get there one of these days i promise yeah, yeah, well you're you're on you're on often enough that we know you're there so on that note i'm stopping the stream have a great night everyone bye-bye thank you all right thank and you off. So that was pretty cool, huh? I guess. I mean, at least I hope. If you're still here, maybe you thought it was. But yeah, I, I have a good time whenever I get to talk to the LGC and any of the orgs who are trying to make firearms uh, accessible to more than just the mainstream of gun culture. Because if this whole pastime and community is going to survive into a politically shaky future, we're only going to survive with a broad, broad base of shooters and gun owners. So... If you are on the edge of thinking about getting into guns, if you're like, oh, I don't know if guns are for me, I'm, you know, I don't look like your average gun person, yes, there is a place for you in this community. I hope you enjoyed that. I also hope you are ready for a giveaway. Those of you who stuck around this freaking long, right? Yes, I got another giveaway for you. Um, we talked about SHOT Show, right, during the, during the talk. So a bunch of patches from SHOT Show. I got a patch dump, and I'm not gonna be picking multiple winners. One of you out there is just getting a whole mess of good stuff. So we've got, we've got an aim point patch. Uh, my friends at Defense Distributed down in Austin, everyone down there making the Ghost Gunner. This is not from SHOT Show. This is a, from Triple Off Design, but these patches are rare. They're hard to get. Uh, you know, another SHOT Show 2020 and the, the rules of Pew Pew. So it's, it's fitting that the last talk, uh, the last thing in the talk is the Pew Pew safety patch. I just said it's fucking loaded. Why put it as something you don't want to destroy it? Yes, yeah, so yeah, get yourself a number of good patches. Uh, you know, if you don't know how to sign up for winning the free stuff, it's a link down below. It's, it's just that simple. You sign up, you get randomly selected, I reach out to you, and then I put things in the mail that come direct to your butt. All right? Thank you very much for watching. I'll catch you all next week. Stay safe out there.